It's the holidays. For you, it might be time to go put up some decorations or make plans with family. Maybe just enjoy some time to yourself. For most, it's also a time for gifts. Do you have a favorite store that you like to buy stuff at? Well, what if you found out that store lost some of your data? How would you react? What about if that data was your credit card information and your personal information? And what if you were just one of 40 million other customers that it happened to, how would you react? My name is John Cordes, and this week, I'm inviting you to join me back in 2013 when one of the biggest retail giants suffered such a massive breach of security, it would set new standards across the industry. An attack that highlighted how some of the biggest threats can come from some surprising places. This week, we're going to Target. You know, there's this thing I've been thinking about since last week's episode. I keep coming back to something that Tank said about how he's going to start his investigations. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, if, if if I were to be contracted to come looking for you, the first person I usually, or the first group of people I start to look for is not you when it comes to social media. If, if I have your real name, I, I may go ahead and pull your account up and I'll put it on the side. What I'm going to do is go ahead and look at your family and I'm going to look at your contacts and who you're connected with and your associates. It's been popping around in my head because that kind of mentality is something we've talked about quite a bit. There's a similar methodology in hacking. Just like how Tank might be able to get more information about you from those around you than yourself, a hacker might not necessarily get the best picture of their target by going straight to the source. There are these tangential points of entry into our networks, into our lives, into our systems that are all along the chain of attack that might reach right back to you, or in this case, Target. Let's start like this. I'm again going to put you in the position of the attacker for a little bit. So, you're going to look at Target and see that maybe it's a bit too big to start off right there. After all, a top retailer is going to have some pretty decent security, you'd think, and frankly quite a lot of potential avenues in the form of people. You've got retail employees, you've got enterprise employees, you've got contractors, it's quite a lot to handle. So. How do you even go about starting this? Especially if you don't want to tip them off that you're going to be snooping around. Well, maybe you start one degree out from your target. Like Tank starting with someone close to me, you're going to start with, let's see who interacts with target. Well, you've got customers, and frankly that's not going to get you inside of a network. But you've also got the suppliers, and the vendors. All these places that Target needs to talk to and interact with to do business, but we don't necessarily see on the day-to-day. -day. So we're going to go back to our roots. Let's just Google Target vendors and see what we can find. And you're in luck, because not only is there information to be gathered from that Google search, you've found a whole site dedicated to it. You see, at the time, Target had open access to what was called their Target Supplier Portal. That site was a place for vendors to come and find information about how they can properly start to or continue the process of working with Target. Just from navigating around it, you were able to find a myriad of information on what vendors Target's using, and digging a bit deeper into the site, you'll also find a pretty easily accessible part titled Target Facilities Management. On that page, you're able to see how you can submit work orders if you'd like. Not much of a way of value there, but you might be able to disrupt service, I guess, if you submit it enough. But that's not what you're after, is it? But then while you're poking around, you notice it. A supplier's downloads page. And on that page is a list of more companies that Target interacted with. But this time they were largely related to HVAC and refrigeration companies. A bit more recon, and you're downloading a couple of Excel files that were publicly listed on the site, and packing up all your new intelligence and maybe heading off for a little bit. And those Excel files you got, maybe we're going to take a look at them. After all, you're the hacker here, so you might look at the files and see them as just sheets of HVAC and vendor data, but you know there's more than what's on the surface. See, every file has these tags that you might have heard of called metadata. Metadata is to files what genetic markers might be to people. It contains details about the makeup of a file that might be able to give you more clues into the bigger picture of where it came from. And there are tools out there that will pretty much extract all of that metadata for you to look at and examine. It's why a lot of websites like Instagram and Facebook scrub some of that data now. 
for a long time, one piece of metadata that was included in your uploads to those sites was the geotag location. That meant it could lead right to where you took that picture, on every photo on your profile. So back to your loot. You might find an Excel sheet titled FM underscore HVAC underscore October 2011. And according to Brian Krebs, a security blogger, quote, you might have been able to see that the file was worked on by a user named Deleso Yadetta, and it recently was printed to a server in the target domain. So you've got the name of the print server, and that's going to give you a little bit of visibility into how they name the systems on the target domain, and what some close stops on the network might be once you get in. After all, just because you know it's there doesn't mean it's accessible yet. You still have some work to do. Let's take a look at that data we acquired again. At this point, we know a bunch of vendors and facility contractors. We've got names, emails, and we've done our open source intelligence pretty well. So why not break something now? And it was at this point, somewhere earlier in the year, at least two months before the data breach, that a phishing campaign was launched. When we last talked about phishing campaigns, I mentioned something pretty important. I said attackers don't often care if you don't respond. As long as someone responds. 20,000 emails could be sent, and if I can get even one person to fall for it, that's all I need. While we don't know how many people fell for this campaign that was launched against the target vendors, what we do know is that the attacker made their way into a company called Fizo Mechanical. Fizo isn't massive, but it's no small business either. They did work with Target in five different states, and their business was located in Pennsylvania. But what did they do? Well, Specifically in this case, they built and maintained the refrigerators that were used by the Target grocery store areas. And you sent this phishing campaign with one goal. I want a user to open a file. A lot of times we'll have talked about how phishing campaigns are trying to get credentials, maybe have you log into a fake portal, but this one's a little bit different. This one wanted the user to click a link and have a malware called Citadel install itself on the system. Citadel was specially crafted based around a framework of an already existing malware called Zeus, but that was more geared towards banking-based attacks. It had a couple different techniques that it would hide itself in your Windows processes and installation, and then it would watch, always looking. But what was it looking for? Passwords, mainly. The malware would look for passwords that were typed or stored in any kind of password manager, then ship it off to one location where they would house all the data gathered. And if they waited long enough, that credential base is just going to build up, and once they exfiltrated it, an attacker might find credentials that a target vendor may be used to log on to their vendor portal. And this is where we start to venture more into conjecture, but investigators and researchers are mostly certain that this was the entry vector, but there's been some differing opinions on how they moved around from here. We know they got that initial access in the target vendor portal with those credentials that they had built up, but they still had a lot to cover. After all, they wanted to go as far into the network as they could here. But one thing Target did might give us a bit of a clearer picture than what we have right now. Target hired Verizon. And you might be thinking to yourself, why would they hire Verizon? One of Verizon's more niche offerings that may not be as in the limelight as, say, their TVs or phones was security services. And they're actually rather decent. So Target Corp hired Verizon to assess their networks for weakness. That would accomplish a few things. It might gain some insight into how the attackers could have moved, and it potentially could have opened up visibility into places that hadn't been checked for compromise yet. Here are some of the bigger takeaways from that assessment. Verizon believed that FISO had access to that VPN connection for vendors that they used to remote into Target's network in order to complete whatever tasks that could be done off-site. Verizon found that once connected, there were no controls limiting their access to any system including devices within stores, such as point-of-sale registers and servers. And if that doesn't quite make sense, don't worry. What it means is that there should have been a system in place where systems only talk to where they need to communicate to. I keep trying to find myself a quirky comparison to make here, but, but it's all kind of failing in comparison to the real thing. So here it is. Verizon compromised a cash register from somewhere you would probably not expect. Think about all the possible computers in a Target store and guess something you think here. And if you guessed deli meat scale, well, you're right. But please, get help. Why would those ever need to talk to each other? Theoretically, it might be to get prices, but in reality, you would think that the cash register and the deli meat scale would talk to a database in 
not to each other. There would be no instance for that to be necessary here. So do you see how A plus B equals C here? The fact that all the systems in the store could communicate and the fact that FISO had remote access to equipment meant that transitively, FISO had access to all the systems in the store, even if they didn't realize it. And using that flaw on their network setup, over 1,800 registers were impacted by malware. Past that, Verizon and Target information security specialists were able to exploit a weak password enforcement, default password findings, and severely out-of-date systems to move laterally where they needed to, even going so far as to get administrator access without any real problems. So an attacker that would come in hard for the gate with that vendor access to random systems in the store, they were able to place their malware wherever they wanted and then just sit and wait for information to come to them. That malware that would end up being placed to target wasn't necessarily Citadel, though. It was called Black Point of Sale, or Black POS. And it wasn't just used to target, it was also used within that year following to get P.F. Chang's and Home Depot. The malware would disguise itself on systems and registers as a Windows service that would start automatically anytime the system turned on, so turning off the system wouldn't have any real impact here. Then it would do two things. It looked for a communication path back to the drop computer and any service that could communicate with a card reader. It was looking at how they could gather information and then exfiltrate it to a point that maybe someone could go pick it up. And what was lost in this? Personal data. A lot of it. Imagine having eyes on every transaction for just one register. How many people do you think go through in a day? Now, imagine that on an exponentially larger scale. 1,800 registers, multiple stores every day between November 27th and December 15th in 2013. And what did they end up making out with? About 40 million debit and credit card numbers, including the CVV number, expiration date, and the name of the account holder. And this was before chip and pin, so that would do a lot more damage. Once the data had accumulated, it was offloaded into what were essentially drop spots in the form of computers across the US and other countries including Brazil. And it wasn't necessarily an attacker computer, it might be something that they had already compromised and were essentially using as data mules. After that, it was just a matter of time to sell them on the dark market online. Within a few weeks, millions of cards were being sold on many dark websites. One of particular note is called Rescator.la. It's run by someone with the alias of, you guessed it, Rescator. And this guy ran at least four of her sites geared towards selling card data that we know of. One truly bizarre fact that came out of my research here was that there were banks like New England Bank, which opted to try and buy their own credit card data back to get it out of the wild or to at least establish the legitimacy here. Of the 20 that they bought back, it was found that only one was no longer valid and all had been recently used at Target stores between the impacted dates. From there, the bank would monitor for fraud and cancel where they needed to, but some already had quite a large bit of damage done, including being used to buy cryptocurrency. Who owned it all? Who was Rescator? A young 17-year-old Ukrainian by the name of Andrei Hodorevsky. There wasn't, there wasn't evidence to necessarily sell him on having committed the hack, but there was enough to charge him on the selling of the data. And Brian Krebs again, who interviewed him, suggested that Rescator may or may not have been involved in the hack itself, but he must know who was involved with it. And unfortunately, that's pretty much it. The people who have been charged were largely tangential to whoever actually launched the attack. We have Andre, who profited off the data breach by selling the card information. And in 2017, a Latvian man by the name of Ruslan Bonders was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Ruslan, who is currently around 40 years old, didn't have a direct hand in the attack, but he did help enable it. He ran a popular tool in the malware development underground called Scan4U. That's Scan the number 4 U. Scan4U was basically the exact opposite of an antivirus program. It would let hackers scan their malware and report on ways in which it might be detectable, so that you could go back and retweak it until popular scanning tools wouldn't be able to find it right away. It was found that Scan4U was used by whoever hacked Target, and that meant Bonders and his partner, Juris Martisevs, were held at least partially accountable for those actions. I think it's a safe bet to assume that the hacker came from that part of the world, given the ties to them being in Ukraine, Latvia, and Russia, but it's interesting here that in lieu of an actual hacker, we went after what was effectively their supply chain, maybe even cutting off their ability to effectively work for a little bit. At the end of the day, We'll keep coming back to one question. 
We know who was involved, but who's at fault? Every piece of this puzzle adds up to a picture of lackadaisical security practices. So let's retrace our way in and look at the bigger picture. If we go back to FISO, we can find that while they had some antivirus scanning capabilities, they weren't properly configured. A typical antivirus scanner would run automatically, for example, but FISO was using VAERS on an on-demand basis. That meant that someone needed to manually run a scan for it to happen. In my experience and personal opinion, it would be nearly impossible to have consistent 100% coverage in this kind of environment. Imagine at a company needing to manually trigger something on each device, meaning you would need to know all the devices out there, including any new ones, or that you'd have to find the ones that weren't online at the time you did it, and then get them online for a scan. It's quite a changing landscape and it's hard to keep track of sometimes. It's why we have tools that'll do it for us. And some of the researchers who were involved in this investigation had the opinion that if automatic scanning had been enabled, the initial attackers might not have been able to keep a persistent access to the network the way they did, and might not have been able to move on to target. Those are two big mites, but it's a fair point. But the other place that might shoulder some of the blame here is Target itself. Throughout the Verizon security audit, it was found that Target had continuously allowed for subpar security practices. They didn't segment their networks at all, like we discussed, but they also had very minimal password security policy too. And when we look at that policy, and when looking at a list of the top used passwords that were discovered, you can see a couple things that should jump out. The top passwords that were derived from a couple base words to build off of, starting with the most prevalent, were target, stores, train, target with an at symbol for the A, and summer. Those were all top password bases, as in people would format their passwords around those. And for anyone who isn't familiar, there are certain guiding principles with password management for companies. You don't allow your company name, you don't allow a year, or don't allow a month or a season, and rule out any geographical stuff like sports names or cities for the area. All of that can be used together with password cracking tools to try and brute force into an account using simple variations. I'm sure whoever used that at symbol thought they were being clever, but it's actually coded into word list creating tools to create variations of these words. And anytime there's a letter that can be substituted for a number or a symbol, it'll add that in too. So while it might fool an actual human person, it's no match for a machine. So why is this all important? Well, if you look at it together, it means that the attackers probably didn't have to do much work to get admin access if they really wanted it. On top of that, it was found that many machines in their critical infrastructure were severely behind on patching. This lag in applying security patches meant that, in addition to the guessing going on, there was a plethora of already available security vulnerabilities for anyone to move around the network on. And Verizon, with the help of the Target Red Team, were able to exploit several of those during the audit. Going from an initial point of entry, like FISO, to the highest level permissions available. So while Target was definitely a victim here, it's hard not to be upset because they clearly were not doing their due diligence. That's partially why a class action lawsuit was filed against them too. Claims from 47 different states resulted in just $18.5 million in settlement charges. Which is crazy to me because that really doesn't seem like the right amount of money when you consider that 40 million different cards could have been compromised here. That's less than a dollar per compromise. All in all, it did cost Target a lot more, with people estimating that up to a billion dollars in costs was spent to include investigations, process updates, new hires, changing any infrastructure, and whatever it took to get their security posture from what it was to something that was a little bit more functional. Personally, I don't think there's any one fault here that could have caused this. It seems like this was going to be the outcome, no matter what. There just might have been different paths to get there. No one is 100% blame free, but that's typically how it goes with these things. It's a bit of a gray area, but it's been one that's been really fun to navigate and show you all. It really goes to show you how you might think that you're just being loyal to a business, but if they're not being loyal to you and, and doing their part to help keep your data safe, they might as well be opening the door right into your life. Because many people had to deal with fraud prevention here. Many people had to deal with stolen identities. We need to hold these people who have our data to higher standards so that our lives are not intruded by these attackers. And that's it. I'm John Cordes, and thanks for listening to me explain what the shell happened to Target. Before we go this week, I do have something special for you, though. If listening on your phone isn't the optimal place, or you want more content, you can check out the new website, whattheshellpod.com. 
There you'll find links to all of our episodes, playable in your browser, and you'll find links to our various social pages, including our own Discord channel, where you can come and discuss episodes with me and others in the community. If that's not your cup of tea, you can always follow me on Twitter or Instagram, at shell underscore pod. I'll actually be posting a diagram this week of what the attack might have looked like from a network map point of view. It'll go into a little bit of like where the drop sites were in relation to the target network and where the attacker might have been. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you for tuning in for another episode. I'll see you in two weeks with the last episode of 2021.